Uh, <clears throat> Aquin, hello. Uh, how are you, everyone? Um, we're going to share our screen now and get started with our presentation, um, which we'd really like to welcome everyone to. It's called Being Seen, Typography as a Tool for Visibility. And um, today I'm joined by my partner, Christopher Sloboda, uh, who's an associate professor of graphic design at Boston University, where I teach and like me a critic at RISD, the Rhode Island School of Design. Um, and we're joining you this afternoon from the traditional homelands of the Quinnipiac people in Connecticut. I am Kathleen Teresa Sloboda, um, and for those who weren't at the education panel yesterday, um, I can share that I'm in La Pamuk and I'm a member of the Coldwater Indian Band of Merit British Columbia in Canada. Uh, Christopher will begin with this. Yeah, so hello everybody, so so great to be here. So today we're going to talk about two, two different projects where uh, we think typography was used as a tool uh, for visibility. Um, Kathleen and I met Quite, quite a while ago. I was working at the Yale University Art Gallery in New Haven. Kathleen was working down maybe just a block away at the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library as in her role as an archivist uh, studying Western Americana. A little help from MySpace kind of connected us uh, in 2005 and we began collaborating. Uh, when I met Kathleen, she was curating a show about Henry Rowe Cloud at the Sterling Memorial Library at Yale. Um, that was in 2005, and, and Henry Rowe Cloud was the first uh, Native American student at Yale University, um, and Kathleen did a lot of uh, research on, on uh, Henry Rowe Cloud, and um, it also became quite important for uh, the uh, Native American Cultural Center, where Kathleen, who was an undergrad at Yale, spent a lot of time, and then as a professional at the library, she was quite involved in it, and therefore you brought me to a lot of uh, events at the Cultural Center, a lot of talks and lectures, and I really um, got to know quite a bit about the place. Um, fast forward 15 years later, um, I'm still working at the Yale University Art Gallery, and um, an exhibition came on the docket called Place Nations, Generations, Beings, 200 Years of Indigenous North American Art. And this would be the first time that there would be an exhibition of its kind at the, at the museum. Um, and uh, also a lot of the first time that any of these objects were shown within a, an art museum context. Um, so the, the goal really became about making stories visible. Uh, there were three curators. Uh, this was a student curated exhibition that worked with a, a faculty, um, uh, someone on staff, a curator. Um, and it's great because students come from all over. They can have an art background or a non-art background. Um, and they're really the, the, the ones driving the show, what the ideas are. Um, so working closely with them, um, really kind of learning about the complicated history of Yale and its relationship with uh, native and indigenous peoples and, and the objects themselves. But the students coming to this show uh, with a collaborative spirit, you know, and how can they frame this and how can they uh, make these stories visible and, and uh, um, so at my job as the designer at the museum was to sort of look at all of their work and think about how can the design help elevate uh, these stories, make them clear. Um, and I eventually arrived at the typeface Ginto um, by ABC Dy Dynamo. Um, one thing we wanted to do is to make sure that it felt like the show was modern because there are living artists in the show. Um, this is about a, a people that are active and engaged and making things. Um, and, and a lot of the objects were previously in a natural history museum um, and seen more as uh, historical. So, so Ginto is modern. Um, Ginto itself as a typeface um, is, is something where it's, its identity is about this tension between circles and rectangles. And speaking with the curators and reading their text, you know, they were dealing with how colonization um, had an impact on displacement or um, salvage anthropology affected indigenous artistic practices and settler museums and its effect on indigenous nations. So the typeface and the tension inherent in the letter forms seem to be also um, in line with the issues that the curators themselves were dealing with. Often when I'm presenting uh, typefaces to non-designers, you know, one sans serif looks like the next. So there's uh, uh, people might not see how special one, one might be. But if you compare Ginto to Helvetica, it's, it's very clear that there are some, some differences um, happening in the formal elements here. And what was great, what I loved about the typeface was that it had these forms that echoed and radiated out 
from the actual objects on the on the show. So here, this miniature canoe and these beautiful oval-like forms are reflected in the counter space of the lowercase a, or the upper uh, portion of the a with this like feather-like uh, uh, counter space also um, echoing one of the sculptures in the show. Even uh, the number five, right, which we think how different can uh, the numeral five be? If you compare Ginto with Helvetica, Ginto has also in the in the lower counter space uh, this beautiful floral form that appeared in another one of the works in the exhibition. So um, I was quite excited about the potential of of uh, Ginto and just the form, just on a formal level. Um, this was ultimately what the title well looked like. Um, so as you walked through the show, you you got to experience. Uh, the letters kind of engaged in a, in, a, in a lovely conversation with the objects themselves, um, pure, purely on a formal, formal level. Uh, this show also had a, the opportunity to design a printed book. Um, so here we have the cover featuring um, work by Marie Watts that's all done with stitching. Um, and we are able to uh, bind the book in red stitching that just seamlessly um, integrated with the um, cover artwork. And so it's exposed binding. And we also had a debossed typography on the cover, getting again to it, the tactile quality of Marie Watt's work. Um, here's the full title page, uh, again, with some of the great people involved, like Ned Blackhawk and Summer Sutton. Um, again, everyone was quite excited about, about this show. Uh, another thing that we thought about for the catalog was just this idea of re reversing erasure. And in a very literal way, for the four different sections of the book, uh, the type goes from being invisible to visible. So here we have the opening for place, the opening for nations, for generations, and then for being. So there's this very literal uh, translation of something becoming becoming more visible and erasing, uh, reversing this, this erasure that's, that's happening. Um, another thing uh, that uh, we got to think about in terms of the publication and, okay, we have our typographic hierarchy. How can we reimagine this? Uh, uh, to better tell the stories of what, what we're trying to do with this exhibition and this publication. Uh, typically, uh, an art museum labels at the Yale University Art Gallery and any museum you might go to, uh, you will find that, uh, you know, where, where a person is from, uh, their nationality is usually less important than the artist's name and then the title of the work, right? So Dutch, in this case, um, was a less lesser in the hierarchy of our typography. Um, but uh, one thing that was important was a lot of people coming to the show thinking uh, uh, Native people or Indigenous people are one group, and we really wanted to uh, help people understand that it isn't monolithic, right? There are all, all these tribal affiliations, and how can we spotlight that um, through, through the typography? So in the catalog entries of the catalog, um, the tribal affiliations now are the same exact size as the artist typography themselves. Um, so here we have Rick Bartow from Mad River Band, uh, or Sam Jacobs from Tingut, um, right? And as you click through this uh, very beautiful catalog entries, all of the tribal affiliations now are, are uh, brought to the surface and are one of the most important elements um, that you would see type of, from a typographic standpoint. Um, also, like on the walls of labels throughout museums, the convention is uh, like for this work by, called the Boston Tea Party is if you didn't know the artist, it says unknown artist or unknown photographer. And the curators in this show, um, they said, well, this isn't appropriate for um, the works in our show. And they proposed uh, to the powers that be at the museum that it should say artist once known so that uh, even if we didn't know, if we couldn't identify it, they were known to their communities and may still be known um, and that this was honoring them in a, in a much uh, better way. Um, so we have artists once known in the publication, we got approval for that, that was quite exciting. Um, and we also said, well, can we also change the convention uh, of what the museum has done for you know 100 years of unknown artists. And we were able also to make that change for this exhibition as artists once, once known. And I think that was uh, a really beautiful um, expression through language and through typography in the show of making, uh, making the, the, the thing, these things more visible. Uh, so again, this was uh, Place Nations, Generations, Beings. Um, and here's just an overview of some of the typography, the typographic uh, moves and then uh, the sort of adjustments to language to sort of uh, make 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 things more visible.
So um, now we'll be shifting gears from that project to do something um, that is to talk about a project um, that is much more sort of related to my personal background. Um, last year in uh, the fall, I was asked to do a commission for Meta Open Arts, which at the time was Facebook Open Arts for their Native American Heritage Month. Um, and as Christopher talked about, um, and so many of the, the speakers at this conference have talked about, you know, thinking about Native America as a monolith and designing for these pan-Indian expressions can be quite difficult. Um, so, you know, in thinking about the over 500 uh, Native American tribes and over 600 First Nations, I knew that I did not feel comfortable borrowing other people's traditions or trying to sort of work in a, in a sort of more uh, broadened framework. And instead, um, I chose with the, the brief in hand thinking about being a good relation, which was really the focus of, of the, the project and the month's theme, to look at my own relations and to look at the material culture that they had produced. Um, so, you know, thinking about my grandmother and my mother as makers, as artisans, and as people who carry on the traditions of the Inlapamak people. Um, and I was especially really drawn to the work of my great, great, great grandmother, Teresa Klamavot, whose baskets are held at the Museum of Anthropology at the University of British Columbia. Um, these works and these sorts of baskets um, are embedded with different kinds of tribal knowledge. Um, and I, I was so grateful because the system that they set up at MOA incorporates um, specific uh, remembrances of in the Pomac people. So um, for instance, Mary Jane Joe, who's my mother's cousin had um, offered a glass that talked about the use of this particular basket and Shirley Sterling, another of my mother's cousins had also offered context um, and looking at the way that they framed the baskets, it became clear to me that the motifs used on them were a type of visual communication. I was also thinking a lot because my mother was a weaver about Salish textiles and production, um, thinking about the way the motifs in these sort of textured uh, and tactile uh, objects can sort of also carry stories and knowledge and often um, were connected to um, different sorts of stories about origination um, and deities. So that was also really important to me when I was thinking both about historical works, but also modern works that, that artists with Cilician ties were making. Um, so I also began to look a lot at ethnographic documentation. Um, there's a lot sort of, of knowledge that uh, contemporary indigenous people from different tribes from glean from the studies that were done in the 19th and 20th century. I think there's um, some resources that are available and I think coupled with the or oral traditions and the indigenous traditions that have been communicated through family lines, these can be a really useful tool to, to sort of inform shape making and form making. Um, so I, I was really inspired as well by, by this sort of collection. Um, and I began thinking of Robofont as a sort of contemporary tool that I could use almost as if it was a, a loom, um, thinking about the way I could use some of the motifs in my great-great-grandmother's work and my mother's work, and thinking about uh, redrawing those motifs to create a sort of vocabulary that I could use um, that would be appropriate for the, the, the brief that I was given. So this is just some different um, images where I'm working with the, uh, the different sorts of traditions, um, the different sorts of verbal, uh, the graphic motifs that stood out to me. Um, and I think I was really interested in using this sort of as a, a form maker, as a glyph pattern. Um, and at first I was really sort of drawn to just forms um, and I did, as I progressed, uh, sort of work in um, some ideas with working with the landscape um, and thinking about the Nicola Valley, thinking about the ways that that has been such an important um, cradle for the community, um, and sort of using those motifs to create made motifs. And then I went also in a more abstracted um, direction, thinking about how these tools could kind of be woven together and create these beautiful um, sort of new constructions using traditional motifs. Um, and again, you know, then there's the sort of work that bridges more figurative work with pattern making. Um, and this is the further sort of full motif. I think this is the full alphabet set um, of all of the, the 
the pieces that were part of the be a good re relation compositions. And I just want to speak a little bit about the colors because they are really derived um, from the, the sort of ecology of the area. So it was really important for me that Huckleberry um, be front and center because Huckleberry picking with my relatives was always an important part of my summer childhood. Um, I also was really drawn to the lichen dyeing and I, I did a lot of studies with sort of ways that colors um, from nature would be represented when applied to textiles. So using those as a sort of testing ground. And then I also really wanted to honor salmon because that is a centerpiece uh, for in the Pamuk people. Um, and there's lots of ceremonies that are built around salmon. So I could not could not literally do something without incorporating huckleberry salmon and, and cedar. Um, and the cedar root goes back to my, my great great grandmother's baskets as well. Um, but what also became super important to me as I did this project is uh, incorporating it in the Pamuk Chin. It's a severely endangered language. Uh, I think the Endangered Library Project cites uh, in 2016, there were 133 speakers. Of that, 2.1% were fluent, which I calculated was three fluent language keepers at that point in time. And, and over the past few years, I've become interested in learning in the palm machine, although I, I have to say it's it's been a struggle at a distance, but I am so very grateful for the tools that the tribal assembly has put together. Um, so I just wanted to highlight um, this resource that the Inlapamuk Tribal Assembly has put together. And I know there are so many efforts uh, by, by tribes and First Nations across this continent where different small communities are creating tools using online access, um, you know, recordings, YouTube videos of elders speaking. Uh, it's, it's just an amazing resource. So I really want to highlight. And I thought that this project could be a way for me to recognize and honor um, the work that has gone into that in my community. This is just an example of some of the um, printed materials that are circulated a PDF um, that I've used. And I think one of the things is when you're learning in the Pomoc chain, the most important thing is always learning family terms. And that's also the way in this project, you know, when I'm speaking with community members, I always locate myself by talking about who my mother is, who my grandmother is, my great grandmother, and my great great grandmother. And I trace that back because in a small community, you're often related to the people that you're speaking with. And there's 800 um, members of my band. So it's very often likely that we have uh, family members in common. And I think uh, that tightness really, really is something that I, I'm interested in as well. It's, it's a small matrix, but a really important one that binds us. Um, so of course, all of this fit really well within the, the theme of the, the, the Native American Heritage Month that was given to me by the At Natives group at Facebook. Um, and they were really interested in using this, um, this theme, be a good relative. And it was, it was broad, I could incorporate in that in any way. Um, so I actually reached out to Mandy Jimmy, who is a language educator at the Nicola Valley Institute of Technology. Um, and in, it was amazing because we were able to use technology, you know, I'm working from the East Coast, uh, to reach out to, to her in British Columbia. And she reached out to two language keepers, Larry and Leonard Antoine, and within uh, like a day was able to, to provide me with two in the Pamuk Chin uh, translations, because there is no translation, direct translation in, in La Palma Chin of be a good relative. Um, instead, there's these sort of uh, phrases that um, that encapsulate the idea. So one, when translated back into English, means walk in a good way, let your journey be good. And I, I really love that one because it was all about movement and um, the Inlapama people are semi-nomadic. Uh, they do move around from time to time. So I, I love that sense of motility that was built into the, that, that saying. And then there was a second phrase as well, be well in all things that you do. And this felt like just a beautiful um, sentiment to share. So I was thinking about a way I could build that into the project because I'm really interested in amplifying indigenous language and in projects that I do. Um, so here's a, a rough sketch and a detail of the Inlapamuk chain, chain phrase, which translates to be well in all things you do. And this is using sort of those glyph patterns that I showed earlier, extending them to sort of building them into Latin letter forms. Um, and then here's a, sort of a, a, a work in progress where I'm incorporating the in the Pamuk Chin um, for walk in a good way, let your journey be good into sort of that more dynamic contemporary pattern that 
felt a bit sort of glitchy to me. And one, one of the things I really loved, and especially when I show this to other Native friends, was the way that the bands of color began to um, be reminiscent of the sort of banding that happens in basketry, especially thinking about this as a, a mural that would appear. Um, in a public space. Uh, but I began to realize like as much as I wanted to incorporate the Lepomic gene, having that English translation would be really critical. Um, so I began to work on ideas that incorporated both. And I think working in that bilingual space uh, was really important to me. Um, so this is the final mural installed at Meta. Um, so as you can see, it, it harks back to sort of that middle ground between the pattern making that was figurative um, like using the figures and then the, the more sort of graphic pattern making and it incorporates the English and the in La Palma Chin. And I love the idea that the, the words are in, in La Palma Chin are in a space at Meta uh, where people walk by it. Um, and I also love the fact that it is a sort of passageway where people pass through and, and they are given this sort of gift of language. Um, so as we end our talk right now, I just want to um, wish everyone the, the same, that they walk in a good way as we see the end of the conference coming into sight. Um, and I hope that everyone's journey is good. And, and the one thing that I would encourage everyone to do is, is to be a bridge, like be a bridge for cultures, be a bridge for communities, be a bridge for generations. Um, one of the things that I, I love about this conference is seeing how many people are bringing their culture into the foreground, connecting, reconnecting, and sharing the, themselves with us. So I just want to thank everyone um, for their attention today.